for Richard, someone who, as we all know, has kind of single handedly shaped out the great combinatorics as we know it today. So, Richard, happy birthday. Um, Richard's list of uh, research accomplishments is beyond impressive and uh, has been quite rightly recognized by many accolades, including the Steel Prize, of course. But what might be lost in all that dazzle is how much Richard has advanced the field by making connections, connections to other areas of mathematics and the people who work in those areas. And uh, Sergei Solini uh, quite uh, conveniently reminded us yesterday of the importance of these connections when he showed a quote by Bob Pearson and somebody, I can't remember who it was. But what this quote opined was that linear projective geometry had lost its vibrancy because it had become isolated from other areas of mathematics. And so that projective linear geometry needed a rigid standard. That's, that's the uh, message for today. But before I say any more about Richard and his ability to make connections, I'm going to be a bit happy that my mock's not getting funny. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. He's the, he's the new, uh, he's the hero here. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So uh, before I say any more, I want to offer a connection of my own. So what do the following people have in common? First of all, Bill Walsh, the legendary National Football League coach, uh, coach of the 49ers for many of their Super Bowl wins. Alice Waters, celebrity chef, owner and founder of Shea Panese in Berkeley. And Richard Stanley, the <laughs> modern algebraic company. Okay, so what do you think? Who, who's got an idea? How are these three connected? Yeah. High school class. It's what? High school classmates. Um, no, no, maybe they were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, the coach. That wasn't what I was thinking, though. Yeah. High school classmates. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what I was looking for is that all three of them are super bosses. So the term super boss means a leader who spawns an extraordinary number of other leaders. So Bill Walsh, for example, if you take the years 1979 through 2015, that 36 year period after he was sort of peak of his power, of the of the 72 head coaches in the Super Bowls over that 36 year period, 32 of them were disciples of Walsh. Quite amazing. Alice Waters trained dozens of award-winning chefs, Judy Rogers, Jeremiah Tower, Joyce Goldstein, and so on. And Richard Stanley, we all know, he educated and he inspired decades of grad students, postdocs, assistant professors, senior colleagues, you know, just look around the room. So that's one of the things that's amazing about Richard is he is a super boss. So um, super boss is an actual thing. Um, faculty in business schools and faculty in board studies, they actually study super bosses. And uh, of course, the obvious research question is what, what makes a super boss? And what characteristics do super bosses have in common? And probably the definitive work on this research question uh, is contained in this book called Super Bosses by Sid Finkelstein, who is a distinguished professor at the Tuck School of Business, and a colleague of mine at Dartmouth. And he spent decades finding super bosses from all sorts of different areas of, of enterprise, um, interviewing them, interviewing people who worked with them, looking at their decision making. And he came up with a concise set of characteristics that super bosses have. And uh, from that list, I've extracted exactly three. So, first of all, some super boss characteristics. Super bosses have an uncanny ability to draw connections between seemingly unrelated areas of their business, often using analog and metaphor as tools to make these connections. Second, they not only make the connections, they pull in talent from these disparate areas and form teams to work on most interesting and important issues facing their organization. 
And lastly, super bosses are not afraid to assign complex problems to inexperienced projects. Okay, so three characteristics of super bosses. I think we can all see a lot of Richard in all of these. Um, and I, you know, when I think of the important lessons I learned from Richard, um, they certainly are reflected here. Um, first of all, things I learned from Richard is looking to solve problems, has to apply that mathematically. You know, the more you know about unit algebra, algebra geometry, the uh, algebras, and the degree theory, the better. Second, how many times have we heard Richard say, I wonder if there's a key analog to such and such, right? So he knew that analogs usually lead to interesting places, especially those that introduce additional parameters that deepen your understanding and the interest of results that you've achieved. And then finally, although Richard is a super boss, he has never been a super bossy. <laughs> in fact, he hasn't been bossy at all. He, he was never someone who said, you got to do this, you got to do that. Uh, instead, he knew that the most powerful form of leadership was leadership by example. So that's another thing that I took away from Richard that helped me not only mathematically, but in, in many other pursuits during my career. So um, my first contact with Richard uh, was a long time ago around 1980 or thereabouts, maybe a little earlier. You know, it was a long time ago, we were still connected by, by wires to the wall and stuff like that. Um, and for reasons having to do with graph integration, I had computed the value of the Morgan's function in the lattice of partitions fixed by a particular permutation. I sub n circuit the lattice of permutations fixed by a permutation sigma in SF. And uh, Richard found out about this, and he contacted me, and he said, Sachi, did you know that, you know, using your computation, I've been able to show that the action of SN on the top of all the potential lattice, twisted by the sign, is the induction of the linear representation of the end cycle, which assigns the generator to the primitive end So, um, I said, no, I, I didn't know that. In fact, I didn't even know that partition lattices had a homology or what that was. I barely remembered what an induction character was. So, uh, but I found this incredibly exciting that you know, we had reached across fields to graph information, found results there, apply them to something important in algebraic combinatorics. And what's even more important was the later learning that this. Induced representation is in fact the end. And so, following being a good sort of student, Richard, I, I introduced that it introduced to me a decade from interest in, in analogs of the end. So, what would an end analog of the end mean? Um, so, instead of bracketing two things together, you're going to bracket n things together. And it's, we're going to ask that it be anti symmetric or C symmetric. So uh, that if you do x1 through xn, uh, it's the same bracket double the sign of the permutation of front. And then what you need is something to replace the Jacobi identity. That's, that's right here. So the question is what do you put there? And whatever you put there, it should be equivalent to the Jacobi identity in the case that n equals 2. And then once you've decided what this is, then the analog will be end with the action of SN on the multilinear part of the space generated by K different n brackets, subject to the relation star and where every variable occurs exactly once in multiplicity. So the multilinear part. Okay, and so um, I want to talk about quickly about two different possibilities for what uh, an analog in the analog of Lee and would be. So the first is you take the, uh, and this is work joint with Michelle Wax, and it's, it's also a really long time ago, 1995, it's about 30 years. Um, and so the Jacobi identity uh, this time is that you take, oh, there it is, um, x1 through xn, 
bracket together, then bracket x n plus one to x two and minus one. And what you get is the sum over all subsets S not equal to one through n. And the those variables are bracketed first, and then the remaining variables following. And there's a sign here, and the sign is essentially the number of times you have to move something past S, something in S past something in T to bring the things in S to the front. So, um, so this actually uh, is the sum over everything, every possible n set. Um, in the work that Michelle and I did, we actually did this a little bit more real setting. We did it in the super algebra setting. And in the super algebra setting, what that means is that some of the generating set are even and some are odd. And uh, the bracket here, uh, it, it's, it's graded skew symmetric. So in other words, if you move an odd past an odd and bringing S to the front, you do get a minus one sign. But if you move anything past the even, you don't get the minus one. Um, Good. So, what's the motivation for this particular choice? Well, it would just be kind of the obvious thing, um, but there is an actual motivation. And uh, that is if you have a entering bracket on a space L, then uh, you can form a map del which goes from the deep exterior power of L to the D minus N plus first exterior power of L. And the map del um, applied to A1 wedge A2 up through wedge AB is the sum over all subsets S of size M um, in one through D. And then you bring those guys, oops, or you bring those guys to the front and bracket them together. And then again, there's a sign here. The sign again is the number of uh, times you need to move an odd. AI past the odd AJ to bring the ones that ask them. So uh, the choice of when we were just looking at of uh, generalized Jacobi identity here, it turns out that that is exactly what you need to apply that this map to L squares is in. So that's exactly the, the uh, definition of in every bracket, which will show that this is a complex, and then you can look at the homology, the in every algebra homology of any space L which has one of these in every brackets. Okay. So that, that makes this kind of a natural choice for, for what you uh, use for the, uh, to go, the generalized Jacobi identity. Uh, so this is a an analog, and according to Richard's philosophy, it will probably lead you to something interesting. And indeed, it does. Um, so there are two elegant results here. So uh, we're go I'm going to stay in here. I'm going to assume that the generators of the three the algebra are all even. Uh, just makes things a little simpler. Um, then the analog of Li N is isomorphic to the top homology. Of the lattice of partitions of n in which each block size is congruent to one on n minus one. So if you think about the case n equals two, congruent to one mod one just means any block size is okay. And then what you get is the uh, the historic uh, theorem that I led with that Richard showed, which is that if you take the uh, the uh, if you take the M, it's isomorphic to the topology of the partition lattice with the type sign. And so what this theorem does then is it gives you the more general setting where you have an area bracket instead of two area brackets. And then the second uh, nice result here is uh, since you can define a homology for uh, these kinds of objects, you can look at the homology of the freely algebra. And uh, the second result is that that the homology of the freely algebra is derived in a pretty simple way from the same last partition of n, which each block size is congruent to one by n minus one. 
And this is somewhat interesting because this result down here uh, is such that when you plug in n equals two, you get that the homology is zero, essentially zero. Um, but not so for higher values of n. And so the the general result of the Lie theory was that the Lie algebra, the, the classic Lie algebra homology of the pre Lie algebra is is zero. And so this shows that that in fact um, this is a, a, an interesting case which extends that result but in an untrivial way. Okay, so so that's one analog, um, but we're not done there. One is not enough. So we're going to look at, at a different analog. This is more recent work, uh, also with Michelle, with some of our friends in literature. Uh, and uh, in this case, these are called n-area Filipov algebras. And uh, the, the generalized Jacobi identity in this case, star, 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 is you take x1 through xn bracketed first, and then xn plus 1 through x2 and minus 1. And then what you get is the sum of all the things that you obtain by taking one of the xi's from the inside bracket and then bracketing it with the things that were on the outside, xn plus 1 through x2 and minus 1. And you sum that over all the possible nuts. So um, where would this, why would anyone think about something like this? And it, it arises in mathematical physics and string theory, and I am not the person to ask about that. But uh, Tamara Friedman, who was one of our philosophers, is the mathematical physicist in the group. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting things that you can say here now as you think about trying to study this generalized Jacobi identity and, and the generalization of Leon. So the first thing is that in this case, the multilinear part of the uh, of this space with k brackets is spanned by what most people will call cones. And these are totally nested brackets. So brackets of the form n base bracket is here, and then though that bracket is bracketed with n minus one different things here, and then those brackets together are bracketed with n minus one things here, and so on. So all the way down here. So in, in total, there are, there are k different um, sets that are bracketed together in this way, in this nested way. Um, because each bracket has an SM module is the psi representation. So this is 1 to the n. This one is 1 to the n minus 1, 1 to the n minus 1, 1 to the n minus 1. This space of cones is contained in the um, SN representation you get by taking the exterior product of 1 to the n, that's 1 to the n minus 1, and so on. And so every irreducible that occurs here occurs in the space spanned by these things as a most k columns. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. So, uh, so that's an, an important observation. So um, we're going to let rho of n k denote the representation of S capital N on the multilinear part of the space spanned by k by k brackets. And this is the analog for this particular binary film algebra. This is the analog that we have. And so we're going to ask what can we say about those representations for all of that things? First, some trivial things. Um, row of 2k, well, that means you're just back to the, the traditional historic case of so bracketing two things together. So that's lead k plus one. So when you think about these row of n k's, that's lead k plus one. Um, if you look at row of one of n one, that means you just got a single bracket of, of n things, and so that's it's such a skew symmetric, that's representation is one of the n. Here's the first thing a non trivial case. Um, and this is a result of Friedman, myself, Richard, and Michelle. And that says that row of two of n2 is two to the n minus one, one. So row of n2 means that you've got an inside bracket of n things, and then you're bracketing onto that 
the remaining n minus one things. And uh, here's a sketch of the proof. So what we're going to do is let n be the matrix of rows and columns indexed by n subsets of two to the n minus one. So that is the space. Oops. That is the space upon which uh, this this character row that two is going to be acting. So uh, let, let's take this matrix M to be the the U B um, entry in M is the coefficient of X to the B. It's only good. I mean, it's not, what do you mean by to the power N one? It's not to the power N. I'm um, sorry. Let's see. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Uh, so I'm sorry. I'm using uh, representation notation here. So this is the dictionary. What it means. Yeah, this is the irreducible representation of S on two n minus one indexed by on the character. That, that's the shape. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, this this matrix M is the coefficient of X sub B and expansion X U via the relation star. X B means uh, that's the the basis element where you have the numbers in B bracketed together first, and then the complements bracketed outside. So if you take uh, X U where you bracketed the things in U, and then you uh, bracket the remainder, and then you expand that using this generalized Jacobi identity here. So find you. You end up with the matrix M being one, having entry one if U equals V, minus one to the D if U and V um, intersect in a single element D, and zero otherwise. So um, so that's, a, that's kind of a neat matrix. Um, and uh, if you take uh, and look at, at what is the kernel of that matrix, uh, that's exactly what the representation row of N2 is going to be. Um, because you're, you're lining up by this relation. And so if you take a non-zero logging space, then that's going to be modded out. And so what's left, have you modded out by all these relations, is just the zero iron space. And so what we show is um, that it acts like the scalar one plus n minus i, then minus one to the n minus i, as the irreducible indexed by two to the i, one to the two n minus one minus two i, which the needs are the irreducibles that occur in the actual space you're acting on. That is exactly one to the n minus one to the n minus one. Um, the proof of this that, that, that this is in fact the uh, that this is in fact the eigenvalue uh, associated with this eigenspace is um, it was as follows. We, we actually construct a vector in this irreducible via the other symmetrizers, and then we calculate the coefficient of a basis element before and after the action of L on this uh, on this vector. Um, then we use that and is acting like a scalar and then we do so. So that's kind of the thing um, as a sketch and I don't you know it's strong by the fast. But let's see what else we can say about these row of NKs, um, which are really the uh, subject of the interest here, because they're the generalization of the free the algebra of the uh, of the uh, okay, and I'm gonna to jump to the case where K equals four. So we just looked at the case k equals two. We had seen earlier the case k equals one. K equals three does not demonstrate the phenomenon I'm going to show you, so I'm going to jump to k equals two. So for k equals four, if you look at row of two four, okay, that's just v five. That's row two. Uh, the first parameter is two. You've got just the traditional v algebra, um, and so this is the the decomposition. Uh, Things here with Josephia, I can buy them and uh, you can deduce that this is the here it is physically uh, decomposition of the irreducibles for row of three. Um, when you go to read row of three, four, you see something interesting. So everybody up here appears here, but with a four in front of them. 
to it. You know, all of these guys here, they appear here with, with four. And then there's this other stuff that comes on. And the other stuff has uh, only three columns. So it's a, a sum of irreducibles with at most three columns. When you go to four, row four, four, what you see is that everything up here is replicated down here through the four in front. And so uh, this demonstrates uh, the theorem, which is the main theorem uh, that I'll conclude with today, which is uh, we call inheritance, or I call it inheritance and stability. And so the inheritance part says that for every uh, n and k, if you look at row n plus 1k, so that's uh, the pan uh, log of the n, but with brackets of n plus 1 things, you just get everything in row of nk, but with a part of size k attached to the front. And then there's this other stuff that comes on, and this other stuff has fewer than k columns. So it's a sum of irreducibles where all the shapes have fewer than k columns. And so that's the inheritance part. And then the stability part says that, in fact, once n hits k and gets larger, the beta part doesn't appear, no longer appears. So once n equals k, then as you move up through the sequence of row of nk, so bracket more and more things together, uh, this is where this is the analog of v, uh, vn when uh, you're bracketing n plus three, n plus one things together, um, you just get that it's the previous one, but every irreducible has another part of size k attached to it. So, so that's the uh, sort of main result that I'll start with, but I'm going to come back to uh, first some open questions and then sort of go wrap up the themes of, of this. So, um, in terms of open questions, uh, this construct where you have a sequence of representations. And every representation is achieved from the prior one by attaching just a, a part of size k. We would love it if anyone has seen this before. We have not seen this, this, this construct before, but if anyone has, we would love to, love to hear about that and know where. Um, second question is, of course, what are the beta of n k's for n less than k? Because that's the missing piece. That's what we need to totally wrap up what the world is. And then uh, I guess I will just add that evidence suggests that whatever these things are, they may have to do with different kinds of forms in which brackets could embed in each other. So, um, you know, we show the cone, uh, the cone things, but you could also have two n brackets and then n minus two things uh, bracketed with them. So. Okay, and so just to conclude, um, happy birthday, Richard. You know, it's traditional to give gifts to the person whose birthday it is. No one's been trying to keep the Sarah. <laughs> but uh, I also note that really most of the gifts we're celebrating today came from Richard to us. So thank you, Richard. And two in particular for me was cast a light at mathematically and all those personal analogs that lead you to magical places. Thank you very much.